that's what makes it so unique, uh, the craft distilling process for, for all of the craft spirits that we find, is that your hand in the product becomes very much uh, evident in the product once you taste it, and it's not blended away into big volumes to make up for any variances um, that you might have experienced. Ronaldo, it's uh, so wonderful to talk to you. And uh, I know you are in the gin making and distillery. And tell me, how did this come about? Where, where, where did the interest start? So we actually started while I was still in high school. Uh, yeah. My brother still came up with the idea of distilling. I don't know where he got it from, uh, but coming from a small farming community, uh, it's a common hobby amongst the farmers to ferment whatever they can and distill in their garages. And my father and my brother started building a still and fermenting everything and yeah, anything they could they get their hands on, they would ferment really? or they would crush it and ferment it and distill it in a in an old copper geyser that they, they converted to a copper still. And this entire process just intrigued me. And of course, I was still in high school, could I, so I couldn't even sample the product, but just the, <laughs> just the entire process fascinate, fascinated me to such an extent where, uh, where we got to the point where I had to choose a, a career before I, I got to study. I didn't know what I was going to study. And my father said, well, I like the idea of distilling. Why not study winemaking? So oh. that's, that's how that started. So did you have to study winemaking first then? Yes. So in South Africa, there's not really a tertiary qualification that, that best equips you to be a distiller. Um, so I thought that winemaking, I studied specialized technology, uh, which means that it's winemaking with the viticulture along with uh, mainstream chemistry. So the organic chemistry uh, part along with that, um, I think helps in, in becoming a distiller. So that just helped explain the entire process of distillation a little bit better to me and there's also a module within the winemaking uh, course that we do um, that we cover distilling. So everything distillation is covered. And yeah, so I thought that's the that the be that's the best course for me to study to get into the yeah. distilling field. But now you're talking about fermenting. So uh, the, uh, and and this is what winemaking is also. This is also part of winemaking. So are there some uh, things that that in this process uh, that would be the same as, for instance, uh, in winemaking? Yes, so winemaking, in essence, uh, makes the base for what we distill. So um, in distillation, we don't create alcohol, we just rectify it and we purify it to an higher alcohol percentage. Um, so what we do is we need to ferment anything with uh, sugars. So if we start with something like a, a grape base, Grapes have sugar in, so we need to ferment the sugars first, and then we can make more wine from them. And when we distill the wine, that's when we get to a, a, an unaged brandy, and we can then put that in a barrel and get uh, what we know as brandy. Um, some of the other substrates are a bit more complex, um, like a whiskey, for example, where your sugars are not in a fermentable stage at the moment. So you need to first uh, convert all your starches to fermentable sugars uh, and then you'll ferment it, and then also through a distillation. So the distillation that's just adds another step to what you already have in the complexity of uh, of wine making and fermentation that comes beforehand. And how much do you intervene with with chemicals and so? And how much is, is of this process is really natural, just a natural fermentation process? So everything is is natural up to the point basically where. Uh, where we get to uh, get to distill the product. So everything is still up to nature. So the raw products that we use still has, has an influence from uh, whatever uh, terroir it was in before we harvested. So even if you use um, a barley, for example, for, uh, for distillation, then into a whiskey, everything in terms of the environment has an, has an uh, effect on that beforehand. And then you get the intervention from the agronomist, for example, to make sure that the barley is grown to the correct specifications for us to be able to, to mash and, and ferment and distill it. Um, and through the constant intervention then from people throughout the process, all of it adds some sort of character or some sort of uh, uniqueness to the product that you end up with. Um, so uh, simple things like uh, whatever you do in the vineyard, the viticulturist plays an enormous role there in 
uh, in even the selection before the vines are planted, of course, from a winemaking side, they would know that as well. Um, and through all that intricacies uh, and, the, and the influence that the viticulturist has is then complemented by what the winemaker does with it. And then the distiller takes it even further um, and uh, needs to, to be quite uh, strong sensorily as well to be able to blend the different products that's been distilled. So we basically get to select which parts of the volatile components that's responsible for the flavor we would like to use and which we don't. Oh, I see. So, and you have to now buy from, so you go to a, a, a farmer and you buy from their grapes. So you don't grow everything yourself. No. So um, it, it makes it makes it easier for us to, uh, to be able to select the grapes that we want. So the winemakers would get a specification to which they can deliver the wines then. Um, so coming from our wine background, um, we already know what specifications they need to to adhere to, to be able to produce a wine that's of good quality. And a common misperception is also that you can ferment anything that goes off. So anything that you can't use for table wine, you use for brandy, which is very much not the case. Uh, mm -hmm. You need to be able to make good wine to make good brandy. So you can't make a good brandy from, uh, from a poor wine. And do you use other fruits as well for your for your distillery? Yes. So when I when I started initially, I started off uh, at the small distillery in Stellenbosch. Uh, we did uh, oranges and lemons, and also a big um, a big tonnage of apricots um, and pears as well that was exported to the uh, to the German market. So essentially anything that can that can ferment um, can be distilled. So we did a lot of, uh, like I said, oranges, apricots, pears. Um, we then worked over to gin. Uh, I've worked a lot with brandy as well. And then I moved over, over to the gin distillery where we buy in an alcohol that's already distilled to a high purity for us. Uh, and then we would add the botanicals to get the flavors of the gin. Okay. So you don't make the alcohol of the gin itself? If It depends on the gin that we make. So in, in the style gin, the, uh, the London dry style gin, we would buy in neutral alcohol because we would like the botanicals to add flavor. And our approach then and our intervention then would be to select the botanicals uh, that we want to be present in our gin and also see how they influence each other. So um, as the botanicals that we need to source, we need to source from uh, and when we started with SFP development, we started with five or six different suppliers for each of the botanicals. Um, and we would evaluate them individually and then also see how they would compare to the other botanicals once they are in the pot. So it comes down to even selecting the varieties uh, of the different botanicals that we'll be using. Um, and also then again, how they would influence each other in the pot and the alcohol percentage at which they are placed in the pot also has another influence and then the entire distillation process as an influence, and then also making this different cuts uh, to select the parts that we would use in the product. So there's there's constant intervention and um, and selection that goes on uh, throughout the selection process. But you're talking about a lot of variables. So, you know, it's not a straightforward process, this whole gin making. So every time you drink a gin, you shouldn't think this was just easy peasy done. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I think, and that's that's I think what's what's good about the old craft movement is to get consumers also to appreciate the complexity that goes on uh, behind the scenes. So normal recipe development, it is easy to to look for a recipe online um, and to uh, to follow a very straightforward recipe that you can find and and distill it. But once you know all the intricacies um, and everything that does have an effect on the distillation process, then it becomes quite complex. Uh, so a common misperception also is that distillation is purely based on, on boiling point. So you're separating different components based on boiling point, but it comes down to uh, more the differences in volatility of the different components and not only their volatility, but the relative volatility. So all the different components influence once one another once they are in the pot. So it can become fantastically complex uh, within the distillation process. And I think that's what that's what makes it so unique, uh, the craft distilling process for, for all of the craft spirits that we find is that your hand in the product becomes very much uh, evident 
in the product once you taste it and it's not blended away into big volumes to make up for any variances um, that you might have experienced. Well, this this just um, proves the point that I I read an article to say that winemaking, for example, is um, as much an art as it is a science. And this is why I was thinking, well, uh, how, I wonder how much this is also the fact with in the case of beer making and and uh, gin making. And now you're saying this is that you can actually put your hand in it, that it's it's very identifiable. And so which makes it then a form of art. It does, definitely. No, there's a there's a lot that comes down to uh, to what the distiller's preferences are as well. And um, just as a as a winemaker has an influence there to make sure that that everything that happens in the cellar um, happens towards uh, uh, not only to the recipe but towards the style of, uh, of product that they're making. Um, and in winemaking, for example, it depends on the on the brand. So if you um, if you are working towards a brand where you have to produce consistent quality throughout the year, then the difficulty and the complexity comes in working with variables such as the environment and the yield of the grapes um, to produce a consistent product the whole time. Um, whereas in smaller wineries, for example, and you have uh, different product ranges, then the consumer expects some variability between batches. So for us as distillers, we also need to make sure that we get consistent quality within batches but because the batches are so small, uh, it's very much uh, a very hands-on process as well. And you can see the distillers and involved in the process, even though there's uh, you know, a recipe that you can follow to distill whatever you need to distill to make that batch um, exactly the same as the previous batch uh, takes, takes quite, a lot of, uh, quite a lot of effort and intervention from the distiller as well. And uh, a lot of involvement as well. So being being present um, in the distillation process, example, for example, itself. We have temperature gauges and we can monitor the volumes and, and everything as best we can. The ultimate cut is still based on, on sensory attributes. So uh, the, the deciding factor is whether we say yes or no based on smell and taste, uh, which is very much, I think, a uh, fingerprint also that you put on the product that's purely based on, on that distill distiller's ability to be able to distinguish between what he thinks is good and what not. And how much is this, how much organic is this process? I mean, if you talk about you buying in the alcohol, how much do you have um, uh, the power over what, how this alcohol becomes al alcohol? So the alcohol itself, we evaluate the, the alcohol. If we get in alcohol that's already distilled to a neutral base, um, of course, there's very strict uh, guidelines as to what they can use in that. Um, and any, any off flavors, of course, will, will be detected. So um, there's a very, a very low threshold for some of the sensory characters that you are able to pick up mm -hmm. on, uh, on a neutral spirit even. So even if you have a, a neutral alcohol that's distilled to 96.4%, there might still be quite a lot of impurities in there. Uh, it's not just on the alcohol that it has to be neutral. So when I previously made brandy for a large site, um, we also distilled alcohol to a very, very high alcohol percentage, and you needed to be able to smell and taste to make sure that it's, it's still neutral. So in that sense, we do get validation that the product is, is completely neutral. There's nothing added to it. Otherwise, the alcohol percentage wouldn't be that high. And that just testifies to the high alcohol strength um, and also the purity of the alcohol as a base. And that then helps us to to make sure that the botanicals where the product flavor basically comes from would shine. So that means that okay. all the botanicals that we also get in, we would smell and, and taste some of them. It's not always a pleasant process tasting yeah. some of the botanicals meat, but we do know how the botanicals should taste. And there's a certain character that we look for in all of the botanicals. So we need to evaluate that as we get that in as well to make sure that every single component that goes into the product, uh, it meets our standards. Now, if you talk about botanicals, how do you get, in which form do you get them? So it depends uh, basically on the recipe. So some botanicals would be better um, when they are ground up, whereas others would be better uh, in a powder, or some would be better to be added all. So that also comes in combination with the alcohol strength that you charge the pot with. 
So once we put water and alcohol in the pot and we have our botanicals that sits in the pot, that would also influence the kind of extraction that we get. Mm -hmm. So higher extraction, of course, means the flavor comes through more prominently and it also influences the other flavors more prominently. So for us, it's important to, to know what in what state the botanicals comes to their own uh, at their best almost. So fresh botanicals, for example, can also be used. Um, you need to know where you can put them. For example, uh, orange peels and lemon peels, some of your citruses, you would like to put them somewhere in the vapor path because their oils are more subtle and you need a subtle extraction of that. Whereas the botanicals, we need a harsher extraction like your berries and your roots, for example, you can have them ground up depending on the style of gin um, and have them placed directly in the in the alcohol. So it depends basically on the on the extent of extraction that you're looking for. This this sounds very intelligent for my blonde head. <laughs> no, it's we, we really always <laughs> I'm really concentrating here. <laughs> we we always tell people when they look at the pot still, um, you need to gauge as well what the interest is from their side if you are um, you know, going a bit more technical or, or not oh, okay. that technical. And sometimes they would say, well, this is this is very simple. It's a very simple process. And we always say that it is it is as complex as you make it. If you uh, <laughs> if you want to go into the chemistry side of it and you want to know exactly what goes on in the pot. Yeah. For me personally, it helps me to understand the process a little bit better. It helps us yeah. to make less mistakes. So it's not as much trial and error as it is uh, calculated ventures. So okay. our, our trials would be would be very much worked out beforehand. We need uh, we need to know which oils are present. We need to know we need to know how they influence one another, and that just eliminates a lot of trial and error, and that could lead to to wastage. So we, yeah. we like to do a lot of calculations and our work before before mm -hmm. we we ever before we even get into the still house. Yeah. But now you said that when you were uh, a young boy, you, you and your dad and your brother, that you made this, um, the, the, the alcohol. So why do you now buy an alcohol? Is it not easier to make your own? So depending on the style, again, of product that you would distill. So some gins are distilled from a base that they would have fermented themselves. Um, okay. That would, they would add a lot of character to the gin. Uh, so for some styles of gin, that would be, that would be favorable. Um, so you can uh, ferment and distill on your own. You wouldn't reach the same level of purity that you would from buying in from the supplier. So the suppliers that we would buy on neutral spirit in from, firstly, uh, when we are sure of quality of the product that we buy in from them, um, we have the analysis saying that there's absolutely no impurities present. And also on a larger scale, it makes much more economic sense uh, to buy it in up to that alcohol strength. Whereas okay. if you use it as a unique selling point, for example, and you want to make something like an estate gin where everything is grown on site, then you might use uh, some of the sugar sources uh, that you have on site to ferment and to distill. And that would add some of the character to the gin as well. So it very much depends on the style of product that you're making and also to, uh, to you know, play to your strengths. If you know that uh, that your gin would shine better with a uh, with the tone of, of citrus, and you use citrus as your base. Then you need to use that as your selling point as well, because it is more expensive than buying in uh, neutral spirit from a larger supplier. Oh, I see. Okay, but now you started now your own distillery. Uh, yes. And, and this is so exciting. Tell me about this. This now. is What's the extremely plan? exciting. So yeah. we. Uh, we were approached actually in the week that uh, that our baby girl was born. Um, yeah. I was approached by someone who saw us on uh, on CakeNet um, on a short program that we were on CakeNet on, and he approached us and said that he saw the the wonderful job that we did um, in erecting a gender distillery, and he would like us to be involved uh, on the production side to start up a new distillery. Wow. And we've been in discussions now since January, mm -hmm. and uh, I just uh, at my last day of work last week friday at my previous position um so this is the first week now of designing a new distillery so we're starting completely with a blank page uh, there's no infrastructure yet uh, we basically start by looking at the different products that we'll be making um, and along with that we'll look at uh, of course all the equipment needed and to to also have a bit of a sustainable approach so we'll see how we can be as energy efficient as possible um, 
and also be as conscious of the environment as possible and a lot of homework. So uh, also looking at packaging from the beginning to end, a lot of market research, um, a lot of trials as well. So after everything's done on paper, we would start with the trials. So having a small trial still and seeing how, how we can develop our recipes and then we would, uh, we would start building the distillery. So we're very much still still on a blank page with, uh, with just the lines drawn in. So very exciting. Yeah, but this is wonderful because this is now the building up of it and you are now involved in it and and the whole planning process. And um, and I'm, I'm very happy to hear also that you're thinking of the environment also and, and being environmentally cautious and uh, because I think this is also very important nowadays that, that you start a business that way. Exactly. So one of our approaches is because there's a lot of energy that goes into distilling, of course, you heat something up that's at room temperature, basically. So you need to heat something up from 15 to 20 degrees Celsius up to 80 to 100 degrees Celsius and then pull that back down to 20 degrees Celsius. Um, so there's a lot of heat that goes in and then a lot of cooling energy as well to remove that heat again. So there's a lot of scope uh, to make sure that we're environmentally friendly with that and with that we don't use uh, unnecessary electricity. We also want to be mindful of the fact that we don't always have electricity. So we need to work, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we need to work around that as well. So we have a few ideas to harvest whatever nature gives us. Um, yeah. And then also some of the some of the waste products that we will be producing. So our mindset going into this is that we don't want any waste products, we will call them byproducts. Um, so everything that we distill or that that we are not able to use, we would uh, think a little bit harder and try to use them somewhere else. So in the distillery that we were at, um, with lockdown, we were not able to buy in the neutral alcohol because uh, of course there was no alcohol movement. So we had to scratch our heads a little bit in that regard to also you know, think what can we do with the alcohol that we have on site. And that led us to develop a whole new product uh, where we could have used the the fractions of the distillate from the gins that we made and combine them and redistill them to an higher alcohol strength that's still not neutral but we can use that then as a base where we don't use where we don't need a neutral spirit um, and distill a whole new product from that and the waste even from that product was then uh, used as hand sanitizer so we oh. didn't have any any wastage on the alcohol stream side yeah that's we amazing we went, yeah we, uh, we were quite happy with how, how that came out. And I think that that's also something yeah. that's a, a unique selling point nowadays is, is, you know, to tell people that we, we approach this holistically, whatever we take out of the environment, we need to put back uh, without harming anything or, um, you know, we don't want to, uh, want to have a negative, negative impact on the environment with, with anything that we do. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. I'm also very interested in that and, and very passionate about that. So I think it's always wonderful. And, and it's so interesting how creative people start getting be, when you just think about it, you know, when you just exactly. realize, you know, and, and then you come up with solutions that you actually benefit from mm. uh, more. So that's exactly that's great. yeah. And the product that we had initially, we actually tried out with uh, with neutral spirit, and we were still in the product development stages when lockdown hit. And um, when we couldn't get the alcohol, we said that we can't really go on with the product development. And my wife was actually the one that said, "Well, listen, we have this spirit. This might work well with work well with this botanical blend." And it ended up adding something that we were missing in our recipe uh, in terms of mouthfeel. So it it actually promoted the product to something a little bit better than it would have been if we just used the normal way of doing things. So being being confined and restricted in a sense definitely helped us to think out of the box. Um, and I think it, it benefited the distillery quite significantly. Yeah. And another another thing is uh, that you are reminded of is that your wife is always right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's very much... Uh, we are extremely blessed to both be in the same direction as well. So Amazing. in terms of sensory activity. Yeah. Is she she's also? also a yeah. She, oh, really? she also studied winemaking. She started oh. out as my intern. So while I was working, um, she started started as my intern. So studying winemaking, you need to do an internship of six months in the industry. Yeah. 
And I did my six months at the large site. Then I started working there afterwards. And then when she was in her final year, four years later, uh, she said that she wants to make brandy as well. So she started out as my intern. And we were both sitting in this confined office working for long hours through the harvest period. And oh. yeah, I think that also molded our, uh, our relationship. And after that, we uh, yeah we got together and we got married. And then we said that we would like to uh, to start something else and and venture into some new territory. So we're very much calibrated as well in terms of uh, of sensory and our sensory evaluation. So the the most fun thing at the moment is. When we distill, we would both have a sample glass. And um, when we smell and taste, when we go over to the different cuts, we would have that aha uh, moment when we look at each other and we know this is the point mm-hmm. that we switched over. Yeah, so we've we've calibrated ourselves, I think, to that extent as well, where we we have the same preferences and product and we're able to to verify and and soundboard basically what we think is good with one another. So that's well, that's a huge yeah. blessing. But this is then Love at First Brandy, or what was this? <laughs> <laughs> it was Love at First Sip, yes. <laughs> yeah, very much so. Yeah. Oh, I remember this. I'm, I'm all about the love. So this is a wonderful love story. I love this. Yes. But, yeah. But now um, I want to ask you now, what is your wish for the future? But you've, you've got great things coming up. So what are, what are your wishes for this, for this new venture? So I think everything should just continue as, as things are going at the moment. Uh, we have been extremely blessed with, uh, with the way that we've been uh, moving along in our careers. Um, like I said, we have a three-month-old daughter at the moment. Um, so everything is just going extremely prosperous at the moment. We're very, very thankful for that and i yeah. think the biggest thing we should keep doing is also have faith that uh, that everything happens as it should and everything happens for a reason so uh, for us just basically enjoying the moment and and not being too worried about the future um i think we leave everything in the hands of uh, of the bigger architect and then everything falls in place as it should um in his time so as long as i think we we do that we uh, we should be on the on the right path to keep growing as we do now. Yeah, and you've got all these great um, uh, aspirations and and the great work that you're doing and and the wonderful thought processes about this job. And I think this is also going to benefit you very much. Yeah, yeah. I think we're we're extremely lucky to be uh, to both be in a um, in a career where it's it's actually a hobby of ours. So. Um, even if I'm, if I'm not distilling at work uh, on a larger scale, I have my own small distilling setup that mm-hmm. I would distill at home still. So it's something that uh, that we found great love in. And being able to share that with my wife as well, it's just it's not yeah. something exceptional. It's uh, yeah, We are very, very blessed in, in that regard and sharing the same hobbies and interests and oh. um, yeah, also being able to, to work with each other, which is not something that's, very common for yeah. husband and wife teams to be able to, well, to work no, well with one another. Yeah, well, no, I know. I think you've got the you've got the hang of it. You've already listened to her before, so <laughs> I think you've got you, you've got you're in the right place. Yeah, I, I I think we know how to handle each other as well. So I need to. She needs to let me understand. Listen, let it let him bump his head. He'll he'll yeah. come back around and then oh, we'll, is it? <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. So we we found a way in which we complement each other quite nicely. Oh, this is such a beautiful love story, really. I think this is going to be such a great business for you as well. And um, and with your lovely daughter as well, um, that's there. So there's a lot of happiness, I think, for you at the moment. Definitely. Thank yeah. you so much, Petra. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're very, very blessed. We just moved to Paul now. Um, oh, okay. And yeah. I love Paul. I've, I've worked here while I was doing my studies as well. I did the harvest at a wine cellar in Paul as well. So we're very happy to be back in Paul. And now we're, we're situated between our parents. So my parents is in, are in Durbanville and uh, my wife, Belongmina, her parents is in Booster. So they are extremely oh, happy you... to have their grandchild yeah. out in the middle. Yeah, yeah. that's so we, such a, we that is complain. in the middle. Yeah, it's right yeah. in the middle. Yeah. Mm. Um, but now tell me, uh, just uh, as a um, uh, just a last question, can you do a shout out for a business in in Paul? We can do it for a business in Paul, a coffee shop or a restaurant that you 
love to go to. Yes. You, uh, yeah. So a very, very uh, a special, a special restaurant in my art, at least, where me and my wife had our first date uh, in Paul is yeah. uh, it's Blacksmith's Kitchen. Yeah. Um, I am extremely fond of it. It's, uh, I don't know if it's considered a, a hidden gem, but it's just fantastically located. And uh, we try to, to celebrate every special occasion uh, yeah. that we can. We would, uh, we would go there. So last year for Father's Day, we, would, we went there and um, yeah, we would come all the way from Feldriff and get my okay. parents in Durban Hall and then enjoy a nice meal at, at Blacksmith's Kitchen. Yeah, so we oh, had, that's had, had so a very sweet. special place in my art. Yeah, oh, this is now, this is a special. This is the, the most special <laughs> show that anybody has ever done. <laughs> oh, this is well, you make my day today with all these love stories. <laughs> well, we, we're actually planning now as soon as we get some of the some of the milestones set now for the new distillery. We need to go there again. Then we yeah, have, definitely. My wife and I would have been there for our first date. We were there when she was pregnant. We went there mm -hmm. to celebrate our uh, our our engagement before we got married. Mm -hmm. Even so, uh, yeah, a lot of uh, a lot and, of milestones to celebrate there. Another celebration there. Yeah. Yes. So now <laughs> moving to Paul, we need to celebrate that as well. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, we stay close by. <laughs> Oh, this is so wonderful. <clears throat>